Hey everyone, good afternoon. Um, we are so excited for this conversation today. This is PAVE's 114th virtual panel. And AV trucking has become so big in Texas that we are devoting two weeks to this conversation. Last week, we started with a really high level, big picture overview. And this week, we wanted to dig in a little deeper um, and, and look at law enforcement and kind of what this um, uh, means for companies operating there and how the um, Texas DOT manages those relationships. So we have three amazing panelists joining us today. Um, Zeke Reyna from Texas DOT. Thanks for being with us, Zeke. Adam Campbell from Gaddock. Adam, thanks for joining us. And Captain Bart Teeter from the Texas Highway Patrol. Thank you for joining us, Captain Teeter. Thanks for having us. Um, we will go ahead and dive in. We got a lot of great audience questions, so we'll try to integrate as many of those to, into the conversation as we can, too. So I'm glad to see that so many people are eager to put this discussion. Um, Zeke, I'm going to start with you. In, in 2017, the Texas State Legislature authorized AVs to operate in Texas. Curious if you can just start really big picture and give us a high level overview of what operations in the state look like. Since yeah, then. Absolutely. Uh, and first, before we even get started, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it, it means a lot. Um, we, we've been um, very fortunate here in Texas to have a lot of uh, really good partners that have come to the state to operate and, and uh, really appreciate you recognizing that and having this conversation. And thanks to all who have joined us. Um, so, yeah. So since 2017, uh, AV operations have, have, have really taken off in Texas. Um, they've grown and spread across the state. Uh, we've had some form of testing or deployments in 21 of our 25 tech stop districts. Uh, so for kind of context, uh, that that's a, over 90% of, of the areas that we uh, have offices and, and represent uh, having some form of operation taking place. Uh, and a large number of those has been AV freight. In fact, it's, it's absolutely the largest. Uh, since 2017, there's been over a dozen pilots and deployments across the state. Um, but there's also been AV passenger deployments uh, in three of our urban areas, uh, and there's been delivery robot operations across multiple cities and college campuses all around the state. Um, we, we really got a chance to, to watch AV evolve, um, not just from a, from a planning conversation, but now to full-scale operations, and uh, we've been able to experience the evolution of the technology along the way. That's really interesting. I didn't realize it was that large of a percentage of the state that it's, it's covering. That's fascinating. Um, and then Adam, curious from an operator's perspective, what, what brought Gaddock to Texas? And hoping you can just give us a little bit of an overview of your operations there. Yeah, of course. And again, it's just before I dig into there, just to echo uh, Zeke's comments there. Thank you very much uh, for all of the PAVES community for joining today uh, and as well for uh, Captain Teeter and uh, and Zeke to, to join the conversation as well. I think what's so important as part of what we're doing here is, you know, to bring what often happens in, you know, I don't say closed uh, door conversations, but conversations that the public typically don't get to see much of. And, you know, I think the part of this effort is to put more of that out there so that uh, those who aren't involved in those can see more of how highly uh, interactive and engaged uh, companies like Gaddock are with our, with our state and local and federal partners. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, so as far as operations in, are concerned in Texas, I think it's, it's helpful to start sort of to give a sense for what we do and then sort of the reasons why uh, we're here doing it. Uh, so Gaddock is a developer and operator of autonomous straight trucks for B2B short haul logistics. Uh, and, you know, from a business standpoint, what that means for us is that we work with some of the, the nation's and the continent's largest uh, companies, uh, grocers and CPG uh, product developers. Uh, we started in 2017, you know, sort of garage band story, if you will, out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and in 2022, uh, launched commercial operations uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, and as today, as of today, we call on, like, up to eight or so uh, Fortune 500 companies in the state, our, uh, our customers, uh, including Pitney Bowes and Kroger, um, which we're very proud to be working with here. Uh, but the reason we're here able to operate with them is because, uh, you know, for a number, a number of reasons, one of which is the regulatory landscape that does provide us the, the favorable opportunity not only to test, uh, but also to, also to deploy with our customers. And this is a sentiment, you know, that uh, that is re it's real for us and that this is a real commercial operation within the state. We are not a sandbox uh, sort of science experiment uh, type company or operation. We are a real mover of real freight for real paying and uh, long-term 
uh, customers here. And um, the, the foundation from a, a regulatory landscape allows us to do that, it allows our customers to feel free to commit to companies like ours for the long term. And we're incredibly appreciative of that. Um, you know, outside of the, the sort of the landscape in that sense, uh, the uh, the weather is fairly good here. Uh, I'm a recent transplant actually from Canada. So uh, the weather has been fairly good uh, since I've been here for the last eight months. Though so there is a ice storm that we hear coming every once in a while, which we tend to have pretty good line of sight to. Uh, but there, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint as well, there's a lot of very positive reasons for the, for why we're here. And not just Gaddock speaking broadly across the freight movement space, why there is this, con this concentration of efforts within the state. Yeah, absolutely. Really helpful. Thank you. Um, and Captain Dieter, want to bring in your your view as well. Curious how the authorization for AVs has changed the way that the Texas Highway Patrol operates and, and what kinds of benefits or challenges you've encountered with the addition of AV um, vehicles and trucks on the roads. Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll just echo the, the Zeke and, and Adam's comments, thanking you for doing this and, you know, Echoing what a great partnership it's been between TxDOT, Text to CBS, and developers and and others within the state, you know, through the the task force and and other venues. But it's nice to have a a platform to talk about this. It, it, you know, going back to 2017, we've had the AV statute on on the books since 2017, and really, it's been a slow burn in, in getting. Um, you know, getting AVs deployed. And now in the last couple of years, we've seen that that snowball start to accelerate. So so we haven't had a lot of, of changes or effect thus far, but now with the, with the kind of explosion in, in the freight segment of AV within Texas, you know, now we're talking about commercial vehicles and we're talking about a whole nother <laughs> regulatory um, structure that they, they have to adhere to and and one of the things that we have to be able to do or historically have had to been able to do is to inspect those inspect those trucks um, in transit pull them over stop them pull them in for an inspection do those safety inspections you know to the to the standard set you know um, you know with FMCSA and the commercial vehicle safety alliance and that's become you know, that was a problem that needed to be solved. How are we going to do that when there's no driver to to turn the lights on, to push the brakes, to, to work the windshield wipers, make sure that those components that have to work and that we check in a typical inspection are, are, are functioning. And, and so we've had to come up, you know, CBSA dedicated an entire working group to this for, for several years to work on the problem. And, and we landed on an, an enhanced pre-trip inspection, which is uh, basically a dispatch based inspection. Those in the, in the freight world are familiar with the pre-trip inspection. This is, this is an, you know, as, as the name states, an enhanced inspection where uh, essentially these trucks are being inspected to the level one, which is the highest level of CBSA inspection level one plus every 24 hours or before dispatch. And so then we had to come up through some of our other technology providers with a, a way to communicate that, that that truck had been inspected. And once we do that and marry those two pieces up, then we can bypass these trucks from our way stations and not have to deal with how do we how do we account for not having a driver? Um, the upshot of it is uh, these trucks are inspected more often and more completely probably than any other fleets on the road. So, uh, so far, so good. We've been, we've been running, um, you know, kind of a, a, a test program with some of the carriers, some of the developers here in Texas at our, our inspection facilities now for, for six or eight months. And, and so far the, the results have been, have been good. So that's been the biggest change so far is, you know, just figuring out how to do the things that we've historically done with drivers when yeah. no drive. Inspection process, that's fascinating. Um, and Zeke, wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, in the last six years since the legislation passed, curious what you would say were the lessons learned. And I guess where I'm, what I'm curious about, we have a lot of other states that we talk to and, and what they always want to hear is from states who have been through this process, you know, what advice would you give them? Well, you know, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and gosh, when you say six years, uh, it it's amazing how fast time has flown. Um, it, it's been uh, an awesome experience. Um, so to answer your question, the most uh, significant lesson I'd say we've learned along the way is, is the true importance of communication. Um, we've been very fortunate to have great partners uh, in the AV community and, and at our sister agencies uh, discussing AV from, from day one. Um, these companies 
from the first time they were here, they're, even before they were here, they were reaching out uh, to state officials to share what they do uh, and how we could work together for, for that safe and, and successful deployment. Uh, it, it was very early on, we said, uh, we don't know what we don't know. And, and the AB uh, community really took extra steps to help engage us, uh, to help educate us, help us understand their technology, and really welcome us with open arms. Um, but I'd say this is really this isn't unique just to Texas. Um, we, we, um, we've seen AV operators developing these partnerships uh, across uh, across the country, across all levels of government. Uh, and, and I think I would share that exact sentiment to other states as well as um, building those relationships at all levels of government along the way. Um, here, we, we've been very fortunate. We have great relationships uh, at, at the local level. Uh, and that enables us to be able to connect AV companies uh, with those partners on a regular basis. And, um, we, we're we're fortunate that community really shares information amongst themselves too. Uh, whenever there's new companies that are interested in the space, um, they they somehow know my email address. I, they they reach out, uh, and we immediately we engage. We we have common conversations about what they're where they are in their processes, what they're looking for, where they might be interested in going. And, uh, that enables us to be able to connect them and help help make that uh, transition to Texas uh, as smooth as possible for them coming in. Yeah, great. And then, Adam, speaking of other states, curious, um, obviously, from an operator's perspective, the Texas um, um, legislation is, is you know pretty friendly to let you operate there. But obviously, a lot of trucks have to cross state lines. And I'm curious what that means for you. What does that look like? And what are the challenges of this kind of patchwork approach of, of states having different policies and regulations? Uh, well, from an operational standpoint, um, as long as the state allows us to conduct both our testing operation and our commercial uh, commercial deployments with customers, um, we are able to conduct any and all of our operation as necessary um, under that type of framework. Um, Texas does allow us to do that, and uh, hence why you know our, our focus is on densifying our operations uh, within the state. Uh, but as a carrier, what we do, like we operate within the state, we don't cross state lines as we don't carry freight across state lines at the moment. Uh, and so as long as the, within the state line, uh, the, our, um, the regulations are in place to allow us to conduct both testing and commercial operations, uh, we don't have to deal with that added complexity of sort of coast to coast stringing together, um, you know, a bunch of those patchwork regulations, as you mentioned, Tara, to allow us to successfully deploy our operations. We're very fortunate for that. Uh, and, but the, the reason is, is because of the manner in which we operate in the, in the segment of the supply chain in which we do what we call the middle mile uh, in short haul operation. We tend to not travel any further than about 150 miles in any one direction. And uh, if you're in the DFW Metroplex, uh, it's tough to find a border within 150 miles. Um, so you you are uh, within uh, those ranges and across other states in which we operate as well, uh, Arkansas being another and in uh, the great white north of, of, Can of Canada and Toronto, Ontario. Um, so it doesn't affect our operation at all, but that doesn't mean that expansion isn't uh, part of our, our plan, future plans. And so our policy teams are consistently engaged with other state uh, leaders, regulators, law enforcement, personnel, uh, and DOTs and these various jurisdictions as well to ready them for commercial uh, CMV operation um, and uh, to position GADIC for success in those states in the future. Um, yeah, as you were mentioning earlier, the, the benefits of Texas, it, it also is a big state. Um, um, Captain Teeter, you have mentioned some of the, the changes in terms of inspections that you've um, been doing. As, as you look toward further integration of ABs on Texas roads, um, how is how are you all preparing for that? How are law enforcement agencies preparing for that? And, and then also, what do you need from operators and from the private sector to do your job effectively? What, what we need right now, what we experience when we first broach this subject with any any group of first responders is typically skepticism and fear of the unknown. And so our biggest challenge is educating first responders um, that the, A, this is coming and B, this is, this is not a, a robot apocalypse, right? This, this is, it's going to be okay. There are, there are some great, um, we expect great safety benefits from this. We, we think this is a positive for, for, for our professions. And, and, and so getting that word out there and, and, 
what we need from the developers, what we're getting from the developers, um, all of them is the opportunity to come out and take groups of first responders to see see their see, see their trucks, um, whether that's static, whether that's um, going for rides. That really seems to help convince a lot of folks. If we can get folks in, the more folks we can get in a truck. You know, they, they come away as believers. And, and, and we've done that. We were recently at Gaddix facility. We had folks up there for, for their grand opening. Just last week, we had, um, we had uh, numerous folks from our, our Texas Panhandle uh, districts go over to Albuquerque and, and kick the tires on, on Torx operation and see what's going on. And those conversations, uh, seeing the technology in action and having those conversations about this this is how you will interact with an automated vehicle if you have to. I mean, we're, we're taking the steps to mitigate, you know, the, the amount of times we have to interact, but there are going to be times when we have to. How do we how do we do that? And and the the all of the carriers, the ones I've mentioned, plus, you know, uh, you know, Waymo, Aurora, Kodiak, all of them have had us out to their to their facilities they've been more than willing to show off uh, the technology and talk about how how this is going to work in a in a real world setting we've still got questions to answer there are going to be more questions that come up as as this expands but the, that those partnerships we talked about early on and, and that zeke just re-mentioned uh, earlier we're they're paying dividends and and we're getting the information out it's just it's it's going to take time yeah. And it's, you know, exactly what you said is what we've found with the public at large with PAVE that education and exposure are the two things that help people understand the technology. So it makes sense that that's Absolutely. with law enforcement officers as well. Um, so you wanted to pivot a little bit and start and talk about workforce. Um, I know the tech, the state has done a lot to try to um, address workforce opportunities and help the state prepare workers for new jobs in this industry. Can you talk about some of the things that Texas has done on the AV workforce front? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think it's no secret. Texas is a state that, that believes in the importance of uh, economic prosperity and, and future workforce. Um, so much so that uh, Texas has a, a connected and automated vehicle task force. Uh, and on that, we created a subcommittee specifically designed to, to look at these conversations. Um, AV creates opportunities for businesses and, and for economic development to go hand in hand. Um, and, and Texas has is, is always been open for innovation. And, and I think we see that with companies moving here for, for their operations and deployment. Uh, and they're working to create those future workforce opportunities. Um, they've shown us uh, through multiple conversations and some of their actions that they're, this is really an, an important topic for them. And it's enabled us to, to be able to come to the together, uh, together to the table. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, partnerships develop uh, across the state between AV companies and uh, institutions of higher learning. Um, one that, that immediately comes to mind is uh, a partnership between Neuro and uh, San Jacinto Junior College uh, down in the Houston area. Um, they have a curriculum that's specifically designed to provide students uh, with that necessary skill set to be able to uh, go to work in the AV community upon graduation. So um, there, there's other conversations taking place, uh, I know, in the DFW area, uh, and some of the other uh, major universities uh, across the state. So um, we continue to engage. We, we are um, having conversations uh, at multiple fronts of being able to encourage this uh, growth and, and to not only reach out from that uh, high institution of higher education, but uh, what's next at the K through 12 level? Uh, and how do we engage at the STEM level uh, at, at elementary, middle, and high schools? We, we're, we're excited to uh, continue working on this and, and to see where we can go. Yeah, I totally agree. I love the new STEM jobs. And then, you know, Adam, also curious from your perspective, is as you all scale your technology, um, what kind of jobs do you envision being created and, and what types of skills would you need, um, you know, for, for from workers to fill those jobs? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I think the surprise answer, the first answer is that, uh, you know, we still need highly skilled, highly trained, safe commercial trucking operators uh, in autonomous vehicle companies. Uh, it's an incredibly important piece of our deployment strategy uh, to include those individuals, both for their knowledge and awareness of what trucking looks like in the real world, uh, as well as to support our testing and deployment operations uh, when we are, you know, slowly and methodically rolling out our technology onto 
public roads and emerging from closed course testing where we'll still be using those individuals. Um, so that knowledge set is incredibly important for us and we are sort of constantly ingesting uh, that talent into our operations on a daily basing, basis and leveraging it um, for the benefit of both our operations and for the safety of our deployment. So on the driver side, I think there is sort of a, a plug and play application um, for a lot of those folks. Uh, but there's, you know, when you talk about new skills, uh, we see uh, a lot of opportunity in the skilled trade sector uh, where, you know, we're building out things that have never really been built out before at scale and having a, uh, a talented workforce able to um, you know, take what they know of how to how to maintain and service traditional commercial motor vehicles and layer up on top of that, um, you know, the, the subtleties and the nuances and some of the complexity around maintaining those vehicles with autonomous uh, function uh, on board is a new skill, uh, but leverages a lot of the old knowledge, uh, you know, again, about how to service and maintain these vehicles to maintain high degree of service levels and, and uptime for, for our assets. Um, and, you know, again, like we, we want to, we always talk about safety when you're thinking about the, the autonomous driver being, you know, the thing that will allow for safe uh, and scalable safety across our operations. But so too is the the appropriate maintenance and health of the assets, the vehicle, like the componentry themselves. Uh, and this, you know, it comes to uh, speaking um, back to Captain Teeter's point around the commercial vehicle safety alliances, enhanced inspection procedures, where training um, of inspector class uh, to conduct those inspections on a daily basis, both in our facilities as GATIC employees, for example, or those who are employed by the uh, by TPS, um, there's going to be an, a, 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 a an expansion of that knowledge set requirement to be deployed to sort of match the demands of autonomous vehicle scaling <clears throat> within these various jurisdictions. So that as well, you know, there's other uh, manners and, you know, and other roles in which uh, we repurpose sort of the driver skill set into remote supervision of the vehicles in which we operate as well. Again, knowing how these vehicles work, knowing the operation, knowing how they typically would traverse through a given area when manually driven, that knowledge is incredibly useful for us uh, to ensure high uptime and safety of our of our assets as we scale. Makes a lot of sense. And then um, Captain Teeter, I'm curious what staffing looks like um, in the AV world from a law enforcement perspective. I'm curious if you envision needing more um, staff uh, to deal with these new technologies, or will the presence of AVs eventually lead, you know, lead to less of a need for um, highway patrol long term? You know, it's an interesting question, and and if you go around the country, you know, speaking to anybody in law enforcement right now, they'll they'll tell you across across the board one of our our biggest challenges is is recruiting and retention. Right, we 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 just simply don't have the numbers of folks applying to get into law enforcement that that we historically have um, for a variety of reasons. And so, uh, you, you know, I I don't see anytime soon uh, a widespread expansion of AV causing us to reduce our staff. What, what, it, what it very well could do is allow for, uh, you know, possibly a meaningful reallocation of our staffing. And that is, if, if we get to the point where we, we have more widespread adoption and deployment of, of AVs and we're, we're cutting down on traffic crashes, we're cutting down on traffic violations, um, we're not having to inspect these vehicles because of the process we talked about earlier. Uh, we, we can use those people to do other, other tasks and, and concentrate on other problem areas. So I, I don't know that there'll be a, a, a much of a net change, you know, particularly in, in the short to medium term in our staffing levels based on, on what's happening in the AV world, but, you know, very real chance that it will allow us to be, be more efficient with some of our, our resources. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, we got a couple questions from the audience. We both have some questions on infrastructure and data. I want to try to get to some of these. Um, Zeke, one question, there, there's a lot of construction um, scheduled in I-45 in the coming years. How is TechStart working with AV trucking companies and other stakeholders to prepare for this construction? How does that yeah. impact? Uh, so yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, with more and more people moving to Texas seemingly every day, um, I remember seeing a number of something along the lines of 1,300 people a day moving to Texas. Um, right. Roadway construction, it, it's its kind of just become a way of life. And not just on I-45, but really across the whole state. Um, the AV industry and uh, has been working with TechStot really uh, from early on of how we can collaborate uh, to, with, the, uh, with them on how AVs can manage work zones. Um, the key is increased uh, connectivity. 
Um, we, we've recently started providing information through DriveWise uh, to vehicles traveling along uh, this corridor, the I-45 corridor. Um, and the information allows uh, freight trucks uh, using a free app on their electronic logging system uh, to be able to plan for obstacles miles ahead before uh, before they approach them, whether that be uh, anything from uh, uh, traffic to to say a ladder in the roadway, how how can they prepare? Uh, and it helps make things a a, a, a little bit safer, it creates that safer environment uh, for all drivers, not just the AV drivers, but all of them. Uh, and I tell you to stay tuned because there's more coming um, on I-45 in particular. We're we're developing. Our state's first innovative corridor. Um, the corridor will allow for more opportunities for increased connectivity, uh, and the hope is that this becomes a standard for uh, roadways, not just in Texas, but but across the country. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll be sharing more as they develop. We will stay tuned. And Adam, curious um, about your view. To what extent do your vehicles rely on connectivity and infrastructure for operation, and how in, or how independent are they capable of being? And and sort of how do you approach things like construction and unplanned traffic incidents that are on the roads? Yeah. So for us, you know, coming back to our use case, you know, we're on the same route, you know, twenty hours a day, going back and forth on the same route. You know, it's quite boring, but we leverage that boredom to our benefit when it comes to developing and deploying a safe, a safe, uh, a safe technology and a safe operation. And so, you know, whether it comes to construction or anything that is sort of there or has been there for some time, we don't just see it once, uh, uh, we will see it multiple times. And so there is iterative learning that happens consistently. It's for the first time we confront something on a stretch of road that we might not have uh, seen previously. Um, and all that gets sort of baked into then the, the strategy around what do we do the next time we come through that, even if it's two hours later. Um, we have the option to stay the course. We have the option to detour around those uh, those areas, um, depending on what uh, available uh, passage there is and whether we would deem um, it safe enough to do so. But we have that flexibility because of our type of operation and our type of network and how we conduct our pre-deployment strategies, assuming that we're going to confront construction or obstructions along the way um, that what we can do, what other alternative routes we can take to not disrupt traffic flow, not to contribute to congestion, but to safely route around it uh, and not confront it at all. Uh, but, you know, there will be things that happen that we didn't expect, whether it's a ladder or, you know, any other random thing that might be on our roadway. All of those things are sort of developed as far as our engineering uh, development pipeline and the validation of our technology to ensure that uh, we can see what we need to see. We travel the speeds that allow us to come to stops um, well before interacting with any object that's on the road ahead, uh, if it is there as a static object. Uh, or any moving object, any vulnerable roadway user, or any other, you know, something being blown into the roadway from the wind or otherwise, um, that is all part of the classic, uh, if you will, uh, verification validation program um, that our and, you know, other autonomous vehicle companies deploy to ensure that the vehicle is safe enough for the obvious things, the nominal driving conditions, as we say, but also the the edge case, the odd uh, circumstance that would challenge any human driver on the road today uh, that we are able to be superhuman performant against. As, as a human who um, drove over a ladder on a highway 30 years ago, I <laughs> find that incredibly relatable. Captain, mm -hmm. um, uh, we've got a question from the audience about data and they ask, um, how confident are you that you have enough data to trust AV truck safe behavior on the roads and what are the most common types of incidents you have seen in your experience working with AV trucks? You know, I, when we talk about the data, I, I think we're still young in this game. Yes, I, I think we have an appropriate amount of data at this time. I, th I think our developers have been very transparent with us on the data, but in, in a in a in a field where traffic safety is measured in 100 million mile increments, we simply don't have hundred million mile increments of, of AV traffic in Texas or nationwide at this point. So, so do we need more data? Yes, we do. But is it coming? There, there's really only one way to get that, right? So, so we do, I think, feel like we're getting what we need. And, and, and Zeke, Zeke might add to that as well. Like I said, we have, you know, we've got that great communication going on, that great relationship with the developers. As far as um, incidences or things that we've seen, we've been, it's, been incredibly quiet i think on the trucking side as far as incidents there have been there have been some crashes um but 
by and large, everyone that, that I've been familiar with has been caused by some by a human driven vehicle, not reacting, side swiping or rear ending a uh, an automated vehicle. We have not really had any any issues with the, the trucking side. Obviously, um, here in Austin, where I live and work, you know, we we have um, we've had some some robo taxi experience, and there's been much more frustration and consternation in in, in that area thus far with the blocking incidents and, and things of that nature um cu couple you know several crashes in, in that realm that were probably attributable well were definitely were attributable to to the av but again mostly attributable to human driven vehicles hitting an av so um we really haven't had any issues on, on the freight side right right now it, it's been it's been done well. It's been done, I think, cautiously and mm -hmm. and judiciously. The, their rollout. Everybody's still using safety drivers. Um, we, we have no, you know, un unmanned trucks out there at this point, and so so it's been good. We are we are pleased with the results thus far. It's great to hear from all of you that these partnerships are, are working and the communication is working. It's really um, wonderful to hear. We are sadly out of time and we have a bunch of questions we didn't get to. We will try to uh, respond to as many as we can on social media at Pave Campaign. Thank you so much, Captain Teeter and Zeke and Adam for joining us today. Um, delightful conversation and thank you to our audience. Uh, we will see you next time.